Uh oh, guess what day it is? Guess what day it is? Huh? Anybody? Julie, hey, guess what day it is? Oh, come on, I know you can hear me. Mike, 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 what day is it, Mike? <laughs> Leslie, guess what today is? It's hump day. Woo -woo! Ronnie, how happy are folks who save hundreds of dollars switching to Geico? I'd say happier than a camel on Wednesday. Hump day! Get happy. Yeah! Get Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Okay, what day is it? Wednesday. Hump day. It's Wednesday. It may be Sunday, but we're talking about Wednesday today. And we're talking about that day in which we need to have the perspective that's going to carry us through. We begin with Sunday, which talks about how we are to honor God and worship God so that we can begin each week with our eyes focused on Jesus Christ. We talk about Monday, how we can make sure that we bring God with us into work. Now, we know that God's always with us, but we need to truly embrace that, to, to experience that, to acknowledge that, so we go in on Monday and know that God's with us. And then Tuesday, as we talked about Tuesday, we talked about the 55 hours a year is not enough. 55 hours here on Sunday morning is not enough to have a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we talked about the importance of being a part of a small group, being a part of smaller groups than this. So you come together and pray for one another, encourage one another, and be a part of God's Word together. I want to, I want to remind you of our theme verse uh, for this series, Romans 12, verse 1. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Hump day, Wednesday. It's another day in the week. It's, it's, a, it's the fourth day. It's, the, it's that day that is in the middle. We have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday ahead of it, and Thursday, Friday, Saturday after it. And so here we are in the middle of the week looking at Wednesday. It's a day where we say things like, if I only could catch up, if I only could get through, if I only can make it to tomorrow. It's a day that we grow weary. The day that we grow weary. Jesus tells us that he comes into our lives and can give us peace. He comes into our lives and tells us that he can restore us and, and make us into the men and women, young people, that he wants us to be. Isaiah 40 hits us in the face a little bit. It goes on towards the end and gives us this great news that tells us that God will lift us up and we'll soar on wings like eagles. But before this, he tells us, Isaiah does, that even youths go, grow tired and weary. So no matter how young you are, or no matter how old you are, we will all grow weary. It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. And so Wednesday could stand for an actual Wednesday. But I want you to take a larger view. I want you to think about weariness. I want you to think about those moments in life, yes, that day of the week, but also the week of the year or the month of the year or an entire year where you just felt like you were weary, where you felt like you were worn down. Well, you felt like something was missing, that your energy wasn't quite what it used to be. Steve talked about running this morning. I saw an article early this morning about a, a runner, a woman from Kenya who was running a marathon and, and fell, and she crawled the last 300 yards and still came in third place. That's weariness, but she finished. She finished the race. The Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. If we do not give up. I want you to picture the toddler who's learning to walk. I want you to picture the child who has stayed up too late, or the, or the teenager who stayed up cramming for exams, or those young professionals who are burning the midnight oil, or those mothers or, or fathers who are waking up at 3, 3 a.m. to change diapers or feed a crying baby. I want, to think, want you to think about the senior adult who is just worn down with life. Whether you are the earliest in life or you're the latest in life, whether you're very young or very old, you are growing weary. And so we have to ask ourselves a couple questions. 
First, is there a solution? And second, can you prevail? Is there a solution and can you prevail? I want to go ahead and give you the punchline, if you will, that the answer to both of those questions is yes. But before I get to the answering how, looking at God's word to tell us how we can find that solution and how we can prevail, I want to remind you of your essence. This is very important. Because if you don't understand how God designed you, you're not going to understand how to overcome weariness. It's vital that you understand your essence. And let's begin with this. God created you. God created you in His image. Let me remind you, you are not some kind of accident of natural progression. God has formed you in your mother's womb. God knows you. God formed you. And He created you. Male and female, He created you. He created you and designed you for a purpose. And He created you with a heart. He created you with a soul. He created you with your mind. And I want you to think about the major three categories. We, we talk about the physical, we talk about the mental, and we talk about the spiritual. The physical, the mental, and the spiritual. Body, soul, and spirit. Now if, as we are, created body, soul, and spirit, we can know from experience that we grow weary in physical ways, in emotional ways, and in spiritual ways. We grow weary, not just physically, we do grow weary physically, but we also grow weary emotionally and spiritually. And so I want to remind you of how we're going to overcome these areas of fatigue, of, of weariness. But I want to begin with those two questions, answer them with a yes. Remember, is there a solution? Can you prevail? Is there a solution? Can you prevail? I'm going to answer in one word. Here's a word I want you to remember. Here's a word to take with you. I'm going to cap, capitalize all of them. Rest. R-E-S-T. Rest. Say it with me. Rest. Rest. When we're talking about physical renewal, we're talking about emotional renewal, we're talking about spiritual renewal, we need to have this word imprinted into our minds. You need to make sure before you leave this place that you understand that you need rest physically, emotionally, and spiritually. God did not create you to be the Energizer Bunny. Believe it or not. God did not design you to... Careful here. Listen here. God did not create you first and foremost to be productive. Did you hear that? God did not create you first and foremost to be productive. That's exactly the opposite of what you will hear so often. Go, 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 go. Produce, 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 produce. God did not design you this way. God simplified it. He said, I want you to honor me. I want you to love me with all that you have, and I want you to love your neighbor. And you cannot love God, and you cannot love your neighbor if you're always weary. Parents, do you realize you're not quite as sweet when you have less sleep? Spouses, do you understand that you're not quite as emotionally connected to your spouse when you're not quite caught up on your rest? You see, we cannot exist as energizer bunnies. We cannot exist under this mantra of produce, produce, produce. And so I want to look to God's word so that we can find some tools to help us get renewed, help us to rest. And let's begin with the physical rest. The first tool for physical rest is trust. You're going to hear this word a lot today. Trust. Trust in the Lord. With all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Think about this concept of trusting God. If I'm in the presence of a person that I trust, I relax. I cool off a little bit. I know that I'm in a safe environment. And you need to trust God. Know that He loves you. And when you embrace that, you physically can relax. You can exhale. You can have a posture of grace. You can relax. So trust in the Lord, which leads to the second, is to sleep and trust. 
to sleep in trust. Look at Psalm 127, verses 1 through 2. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Look at this, particularly verse 2. In vain. Now, you all know what the word vanity means. It it means it's pointless. Why, Why do this? It's a waste of time. In vain you rise early and stay up late. In vain you burn the candle at both ends. You can be so much more productive when you rest physically. Because he goes on to say that God grants sleep to those he loves. This is kind of revolutionary if you think about it. To think that the God of all the universe looks at you and looks at me and says, Go ahead, sleep a little while. Go ahead rest. The church, along with the world, has been guilty of saying, strive, 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 do, 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 produce, produce, produce. That's why in all my ministry, I've always told men and women who have volunteered for a long time, it's okay to take a break. When's the last time you heard that? It's okay to take a break. I I know people that have taught Bible study, whether that be Sunday school, small group, whatever you want to call it for kids or adults. And let's say they're 20 years into it, and about 15 years into it, they got weary of it. So by that count, for five years, they've been doing it because they thought they had to, right? You been there? You been there? You don't have to confess it out loud. But there are times when you say, you know, my heart's not in this. That doesn't mean you sit down and don't do anything anymore, but you rest and recoup and renew. Not too long ago, our paper celebrated the folks in our city that have reached the three-digit mark, the 100-year-plus group, which is a small group around here. And there's Ella Bell. I love her name. Ella Bell. Some of you can see this. Some of you can't. Ella Bell. uh, She turned 100 last year, and she moved to Anchorage in 1950. This is one tough woman. If you're 100 years old and you still live in Alaska, that's one tough woman. And uh, she moved here in 1950, and she's had an eventful life. But they ask her, as they always do for people that are well, well along in years, what's your secret? What's your secret? Sometimes you'll, you'll get an answer that says they were very kind and nice, and others said they just live like they want to. You never get a standard answer. But I love Ella, Bell, Ella Bell's. She says this, don't worry. I give all my worries to God. The world could be falling apart, and I won't worry. I just bake an apple pie. (laughs) So for Ella Bell, her two responses to life, to stress, to weariness, first of all, take it to God. Say, God, this is yours, which the Bible tells us to do that. And then she bakes an apple pie. Now I'm going to go out on a limb and say her mom taught her the apple pie recipe and not have to go out on a limb because she said it herself that she goes to God with her worries. Where did she come up with this idea? Is it revolutionary? No. Jesus told us about it. He said so in the Gospel of Matthew. I want you to go there, Matthew chapter 6, and you're going to find this wonderful word that if you have been in church for any length of time, uh, you, you've probably heard this passage before. I know I've heard it countless times. And I stand before you confessionally saying, I've heard it, I've read it, I've preached it, and I still have a hard time living it. So I don't stand there as the expert. I, I don't stand there saying, I got this down, just listen to me. That's part of being a pastor is you want to tell the word of the Lord because if I'm going to tell my word all the time, it's going to come up short. And so I'm confessing before you publicly today that this is a struggle for me. Maybe you relate. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. 
They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into fire, we, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I love that last line. It's confessional. Jesus tells us right up, straight up, here's a problem. It's going, to have, it's going to have problems, so don't dwell on it. So when it comes to this idea of emotional rest, I want you to realize the first thing you can do is to trust in the Lord. Again, you've heard that phrase, trust in the Lord. I, I cannot rest. I cannot not worry, intentional double negative there, if I do not trust God. But when I do trust God, I can say, I'm going to bring my emotions to Him. I'm going to give that which is in me, those, those thoughts, those feelings, and give them back to Him. So I need to trust in the Lord. Second, you need to kick your worry habit. You need to kick your worry habit. Notice how worthy I use the word habit. We develop habits. We develop good habits and bad habits. We develop addictions, we develop all sorts of things, and habit is one of those things that we bring into our lives voluntarily. We we cannot blame external. Jesus says this. He he says, don't worry about these things. They'll take care of themselves. I'll take care of you. Trust me with them. And he says this again in verse 34. Listen to these words. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Again, confessionally, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you in the past week lost a little sleep because you're worried about something? Or how many of you, even though you're in the midst of trying to get the daily task done, were worried about something way in the future that you quite can't get your hands on yet? Notice that last phrase, you can't get your hands on it yet, so don't worry about it. Cross that bridge when you come to it is another way of putting this. It doesn't mean don't reflect. It doesn't mean don't plan. It doesn't mean don't prayerfully prepare. What it means is don't worry. Worry has become such a common thing that it's just coming to our vocabulary. Don't worry about it, we say. But what we're really meaning is I think I'm worrying about it. I'm just trying to talk myself into not worrying about it. Or I'm worried about. How many of you said that recently? I worry about. So kick the habit. And then find a friend. Find a friend. Find a listening ear. Be a part of that small group that I talked about last week. Moms, find another mom. Dads, find another new dad. It's a learning curve. It helps when you can talk to someone else about it. If you're retired, find someone else who's retired. If you're preparing to retire, talk to somebody who already has retired. Find a peer at school who shares your faith. Find somebody who can encourage you. Find a friend who will listen. Find a friend who will be there for you. We are not to walk this life alone. So we talk about the physical renewal, we talk about the emotional, how about the spiritual? Guess what number one is? Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. If I can take my my faith, my journey to faith or my journey through faith, whether you're on your way there and haven't quite yet fallen before Jesus and saying, I'm yours, or if you've already done that and you're walking in your faith and maturing in your faith, It starts and continues with trusting in the Lord. And second, look upward. Look upward. 
Psalm 121, 1 through 2 says this, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. John Wesley is recorded, reported to say to a friend that you look inward too much and upward too little. You look inward too much and upward too too little. What, what is he saying there? He's saying to this friend, and, and we're saying it to each other today, is that when I look inward and not upward, I, I dwell in what's bothering me. I, I don't feel close to Christ in my faith because I'm dwelling on what's inside. I'm, I'm dwelling on what is here that's troubling me. I feel distance from my Savior because I have not looked to him. I, I think I'm looking to him. I talk about looking to him, but I haven't yet really lifted my eyes towards him. We talked uh, last week about the importance of being in smaller groups, and, and the central part of that is getting in God's Word. And let me be very clear to you, you cannot rest spiritually if you do not know God's Word. The great thing about this book that I hold in my hand, whatever form you have Scripture, if you hold it in your hand, see it on a screen, whatever, if you have God's Word, and you read it, and you know it, and as the Bible says, I hide it within my heart, it's going to come back. It's going to come back. In those moments of stress, Scripture will pop into your head. In those moments of temptation, Scripture is going to pop into your head. You may not, be, may not be able to quote chapter and verse. There weren't chapters and verses for hundreds of years, by the way. Look throughout the Scriptures. Jesus quotes Scripture. Paul quotes Scripture. They quote Scripture over and over again as they're talking, as they're going through story. They didn't say, here's chapter, here's verse. They just said, as Isaiah said, as Moses said, as Scripture says. So if you get hung up on chapter and verse, don't worry about it. If that's a problem for you, don't worry about it. It is helpful. You know where to find it. But with today's tools, you can find another way. Just get to know the Scripture. And if you misquote it, as long as it's not way off, it's okay. Just get to know Scripture. Get to know it because when it comes in you, you're going to be able to look upward. You're going to be able to say, God, thank you because you gave me your word and I'm listening to it. And third, I want you to look outward. Look outward. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. One of the, this is the introduction to one of the great Christological poems of who Christ is and how we are to live. And in Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4, it says this. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort with his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, time out, verse 1, does that apply to you? If it doesn't, then verse 2 doesn't apply to you. you don't, you're not held accountable. But if verse 1 applies to you, you're held accountable for verse 2. So let's go through this again. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. So if you've received any of that, here's the so that. Here's the then do. Verse 2. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing. It's a powerful word. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Now, I want you to focus on two words that I've, I've said there, I've encouraged. That is to, to look upward and to look outward. To look upward and to look outward. Now, if you were to go to a bookstore, if you're going to go online to Google or Bing or whatever you use, doesn't matter, and, and, and you were to talk about personal health. Very few sources would talk about this idea of upward and outward. Most of them would talk about inward. Take care of self. And part of those are correct and they're on to something. But let me tell you very clearly that if all I do is look inward and I never look upward and outward, I am going to grow very fatigued spiritually because as the old illustration goes it's the sponge and if I soak up and soak up and soak up and never squeeze out it's saturated to the point it won't take any more in so let me give you a challenge 
Let's say you're an expert in memorizing Scripture, and let's say you go to Bible study after Bible study after Bible study, but you never serve anybody. That's spiritual weakness. That's spiritual fatigue. If all you do is know the Scripture, Jesus says a pretty challenging thing. Even the demons know Scripture. Even the demons know Scripture. They can quote it better than we can. So there's a good time to soak up. But you need to squeeze back out. So you look upward and say, God, give me the power to squeeze out. And people, here I am, serve one another. Selfishness will lead to spiritual fatigue, guaranteed. So we talk about getting rest physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I love this encouraging word from Jesus, Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary. And burdened. All of you stuck in a Wednesday. All of you. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'll be the first to stand up for Sunday naps. And at least a day of the week to sleep in. And let's throw in a trip to Hawaii and Alaska winters. I'm, I'm all for those things. I'm all for those things. But if we rely on naps and sleeping in and vacations and distractions alone, we'll come up short. I, I know some people that are very happy and very sincere. And... They are in some of the most stressful careers, in some of the most stressful situations, living in difficult places, but yet there's a peace that surrounds them. The Bible calls that the peace that passes all understanding. In other words, you look at somebody's life and you say, how in the world can they be so at peace? And at the same time, you can look at somebody who is going, 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 can have wealth, can produce, can see all around them, and they've accumulated and accumulated, and they just seem to be without peace. Read Ecclesiastes. It'll give you the reason that's the case. But when we are those people who find ourselves in the midst of trouble, every day has enough trouble of its own, we find ourselves in that trouble, we can have peace. There's a classic from the 1400s. Thomas Akempis wrote a book. Ch challenge you to read it. It's a good one called Imitation of Christ. And it's very fascinating. And in the midst of it, he, he writes about how to be like Christ, how to imitate Christ, how to follow Jesus. In essence, how to deny self, take up cross daily, and follow him. And I want you to hear this prayer, and you can see it on the screen. And as I read it, as you read it, I want you to pray this. It's wonderful to, to pray prayers off the cuff. I do, do it all the time. Uh, but it's also rich to, to study the prayers of old and, and pray them. Pray the Psalms. Pray the Scriptures. Pray the men and women's words who have throughout the years written these beautiful prayers. Make them your own. I encourage you to make this your own. Thomas Akempis writes and prays. My Lord Jesus, I beseech you, do not be far from me, but come quickly and help me. For vain thoughts have risen in my heart and worldly fears have troubled me sorely. How shall I break them down? How shall I go unhurt? without your help. I shall go before you, says our Lord. I shall drive away the pride of your heart. Then shall I set open to you the gates of spiritual knowledge and show you the privacy of my secrets. O Lord, do as you say, and then all wicked imaginings shall flee away from me. Truly, this is my hope and my only comfort to fly to you in every trouble, to trust steadfastly in you, to call inwardly upon you, and to abide patiently your coming 
and your heavenly consolations, which I trust will quickly come to me. God, pray this prayer. We pray this prayer. We ask it to be our words. That we would take our troubles, that we would take our weariness and turn them to you. Jesus, thank you for the counsel. Do not not worry, but God, it is difficult. Forgive us for our lack of faith that leads to weariness and struggle and temptation. God, help us to look at our own lives, our physical lives, our emotional lives, our spiritual lives, and turn them over to you and rest in you. Thank you for being with us during this day. In Christ's name, amen.